Okay, for our next speaker, uh, we have Dr. Ravi Sripada here from the Climate Corporation. Um, he's a senior field research scientist uh, with the Climate Corporation, and in his role, he leads fertility related field research programs that are the foundation of the Climate Corps' digital products, helping guide farmers' decision making around fertilizer applications to balance both sufficiency and efficiency of their crops' nutrient needs. Uh, with background in soil science, remote sensing, and geographic information systems, his research is focused on integrating traditional soil science and agronomy with precision ag technologies to further the Climate Corps' mission to help all the world's farmers sustainably increase their productivity with digital tools. And today he's going to be talking about big data and digital ag to improve decision making for growers. So please help me welcome Dr. Ravi Sripada. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. And first, I would like to thank the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the uh, organizers for inviting the Climate Corporation to be part of this symposium. I really enjoyed the session so far, and I see that the examples given so far uh, by the speakers before me were all at a very high level, getting into uh, how do we use certain technologies, how do we use data science for uh, um, detection. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about production agriculture. It's going to be concentric and how we use these uh, technologies to get to solutions to the grower to better implement their, uh, their management practices and thereby increase their productivity. Uh, so there's a lot of data growers collect. If you imagine the grower uh, operating in a typical corn field, he tills it, in the beginning of the season he plants it, and then he's going to be uh, applying the herbicide a few times, and then applying the nitrogen, then harvesting it, and then tilling it in the fall again, and applying manure in this case in Wisconsin or other places. How many times is he driving, and how many times is he collecting data? And at what resolution is he collecting all of these? And that is the information that we are interested in looking at, uh, that is coming from the soil. And then the atmospheric data, weather data that is being collected, whether it is coming from publicly available sources or some that is collected by us uh, in our proprietary weather stations across the network. We integrate all of these into how a corn plant develops. If you look, a, look at the corn plant, on an average, let's say we plant 32,000 seeds per acre. One notion is you got 32,000 sensors per acre. So they are telling you something is how we decode it, whether it is using the imagery that Mark talked about in the morning, or whether it is the crop phenology modeling that we use, or the nitrogen uptake models we apply. So the objective of the Climate Corporation, or the mission is to be able to use this kind of information, use that to develop models in a way that can be implementable by a grower to improve his bottom line and increase their productivity, basically, and then do it with, uh, with in a sustainable way. Uh, why use data science for farming? If you look at the way the agriculture industry has developed over the years, so you know what our average yield levels are right now. You take an average of maybe 160 to 170, and then it started off with your, um, your um, you know, open pollinated varieties, and then you got the hybrids, then you got the green revolution with the data coming in, and then the breeding and biotechnology that led the improvement in yield levels over the past 20 years. And now we think it is going to be how we unlock the potential of the yield in a grower's field by using the data he's collecting, and based on the examples I talked before. If you take a typical yield uh, grower, right? We said 170 is the average corn yield. If you, but we see here examples, whether it is a National Corn Growers Association, a typical grower, some of the fields uh, yield about north of 300 bushels. And where average is about what, 170. So you know, I don't say that every field will be babied like that to get to 300 bushels and it won't become sustainable. But given that there is such a huge gap in the yield potential between what can be achieved to what is the average right now, 
what can we do with utilizing the data layers that are being collected to help decrease the gap and increase the productivity and production. And now this relates to the population issue that was raised earlier. How do we get to feed the 9 billion or 10 billion on the population going forward, knowing that the land is going to be very limited? So variability. Sorry. Variability is the biggest issue for us. It is both a challenge and an opportunity. Challenge is a grower is planting and he's harvesting and he's saying, I'm seeing anywhere ranges from 80 bushels to 220 bushels in a particular field of corn. How do I manage that? What can I do to improve it? Whether it is corn, beans, soybeans, or wheat, or rice, or even for that matter, milo. How do we, change, how do we address that? The opportunity is we got so much of data that we are collecting. Can we better utilize those to build information layers and insights to the grower to better manage that part? That's where the data science comes into picture. Uh, so we talked about variability, but what are the variables that cause that variability within a field? We know that uh, if you take one of the one of the thought process coming in from University of Illinois, there are multiple factors that can influence a corn yield in a given year. But two thirds of that are manageable factors. Weather, I know one of the speakers, Dr. Desai said it is the easiest one, but for us it is the most uncontrollable one because you don't know. Uh, I'll quote uh, Jerry Hatfield, he's the director of uh, uh, National Lab for Ag and Environment in Iowa. He says, you know, nitrogen is not rocket science, it is tougher than that uh, because this is right now, let's say we're in April, can you tell me how much nitrogen I need to raise 200 bushel of corn in central Wisconsin? Within a 10, 15, 20 pounds of uh, accuracy? Probably not. But down the lane, we can tell when to launch a rocket. Anyway, so of the three, these factors that can be manageable, you know, nitrogen, hybrid, and previous crop, which I go into tillage, uh, these are the most important ones. And we have lots of data that our growers are being collected. The state of the data is an issue that can be debatable, but there is a lot of information. How do we get these together to help growers manage that? So how many additions does a grower make in a given year? About 40 for a given field. Whether you start from planting in the winter or it is pre-planting right now, probably for Wisconsin because of the rain, they're probably not planting for a week to 10 days anyway. And when they make the decisions on what hybrid they want to plant, what populations they want to plant, and then at planting time is, how do I get to the different uh, herbicides and insecticides or post-planting post insects that I need to apply? And then the, within the growing season, how do I manage my nitrogen, irrigation if it is an irrigated field, and how do I manage my uh, scouting aspects? All of these together, should be able to help us to make a better decision. If you take the data acquisition, if you take in the pre-planting, data management, analytics, and then product and service delivery. Those sh together help, should help the grower better manage his, uh, manage his decision making process and thereby increasing yield. So how do we, how do we as a climate corporation approach uh, data science? Uh, those of you in the room I've see, seen probably in the past 20 years or 30 years, you know how data is being managed by growers. Where the tickets coming from the elevator to the cables, to the uh, drives that are sitting down on the, to the bag tax from the uh, bag you planted. You know, keeping track of all of this has been very, very dysfunctional so far. It is not in, together in one place. And somebody made the comment about looking at a cab in a, in a, in a, in a tractor of a grower, right? Right now, five years ago when we started this project in, in Monsanto Climate, we went to visit a few growers and you could see that the entire layer below the eyesight on the cab is covered with all the, all the uh, dashboards, if you will, right? It's too many, cluttered with many cables. How do we simplify that? As one of the scientists in uh, Monsanto used to call, we need to make an iPad easy. Now, how do we get it to maybe one, if not two, but centralize the information system that he's talking about. And then one of the biggest things that we've been using and uh, uh, we've been promoting is using this uh, field view. Um, this is called, a, a brand name is the field view, but what it is is a, uh, it is a unit that fits into the ISO canvas of a tractor and is, can collect each and every piece of information you're, uh, you're doing in the field, whether it is uh, planting or, or uh, spraying or nitrogen or yield 
All of that will be captured and by a Bluetooth connection. He can see it on the iPad on the field right then and there, make informative decisions right now, and then upload it to his cloud account, and he can see it in his shop on his computer. But the data, let's say he's planted a different variety in a field, because growers are the biggest experimenters in my mind. They, if you give them, a, give them a hybrid, they'll tell you, okay, I'll put it with my legacy hybrid and check it. Whether you give them nitrogen treatment to say, they're going to put their own practice and check here. But if you have this uh, unit and then he's checking the yield data at harvest, he's making a decision right when he's harvesting because that input is needed at that time to make a choice on the hybrid for the spring because the seed decisions are made much earlier in the growing season. So those are some of the examples of uh, how we are doing that. How, but in order to give them information to make a better decision on their management factors, we need data. And observational data versus uh, targeted experimental data. So observational data, so far using the FieldView app, we have about 92 million, so a million acres that have been mapped into the system. Uh, we use some of that information. There is data privacy issues on that. I'll touch on it a little bit later. And then we got the thousands of uh, acres of research that we do as part of Monsanto, whether it is small plot or pre-commercial or going into a breeding pipeline or going to a biotech pipeline where we do for small plot research of four rows by 20 feet or 40 feet, depending upon the crop, where we have a, spe a special planter that can plant uh, multi 60 hybrids by five populations in small plot structure within 30 acres that gives us responsiveness of multiple hybrids on how they respond to densities. And then we got climate research farms uh, across the Midwest. Uh, we got five so far, two in Illinois, one in uh, India, one in um, Iowa, one in South Dakota, and one in Nebraska, where we do everything is grower scale. Our smallest plot in this case is 40 rows by 300 feet. Because one of the issues we learned over the past, whether it is the Prishan Ag research going into the late 90s and early 2000s, we can't replicate a small plot output to a go over 80 acre field. So we have to implement those in an 80 acre field. So that's what we do uh, at, uh, at the climate research farms. And then we have a network called uh, Climate Research Partners, where we work with uh, our field team, work with growers in the field who are forward looking and would like to try out new protocols with us and we implement field research, about 35,000 acres. So all these kinds of data layers together feed into our uh, data platform. Now, how do we productize it, right? Um, I like the comment people made before is, uh, you know, a domain scientist by, by himself can't do much. He needs a, a statistician or a software engineer. Software engineer, machine learning by itself can't help. This is where we, I think, differentiate ourselves. Every project we do has a combination of these three or, three or four people. Mainly the domain scientists like me, who I'm a trained soil scientist. I work with a bunch of statisticians and software engineers together. So none of the projects uh, we do do not have any of these three combinations. It has to be those three combinations and led by somebody who's in a product management team that relates to the grower so that the solution is, is uh, what, the, what the customer wants. So I told you about the different platforms we are talking. So in-cab connectivity, the grower has this uh, field view cab uh, app in the, in, in the cab, and he's collecting all that data. Whether it is, if he's not on that platform, that is fine. We still allow the data to come in through, uh, let's say, a green or a blue or a red tractor. We are agnostic of that. So we have relationship with uh, OEMs to get to different kinds of information. And then uh, whether it is uh, Grover has a data in his thumb drive that he wants to upload, that should be doable too. We get those in, and then the team sits in and does the analytics. Yeah, and that is used by the Grover to do any of these, uh, these um, uh, decision-making processes, whether it is using the yield data to make zones, prescriptions, uh, or it is for nitrogen management, or even perform, uh, analyzing different uh, hybrids at the end of the season. So uh, the way we prioritize this is we got the Climate uh, Prime Pro and Plus. Prime is a free version that you know, some of you who are in agronomy or so might have experienced it, where it gives you uh, weather-related information at a field scale. And then Climate Prime is where they have this um, uh, ISO canvas uh, uh, field view cab that fits into the system and collects all the data and makes, just making his data available to him to use it. Uh, 
And then the pro is where we use our algorithms and data science to give him a, a insight into what's going on in the field. And those are the main things we do. Um, so those are the monitoring tools, mostly towards nitrogen, field insights or scouting, and then about uh, seeding scripts. Uh, every year, uh, give you specific examples on the different projects we are working on. Every year, Monsanto, uh, about the second or third week of January, makes a public announcement to the investors on their pipeline, technology pipeline. So what are we working on? Where are we in terms of development? And this is the first year in 2016-17 that Climate is also a part of that announcement, and we said, what are we working on to help growers manage, uh, manage their uh, farm? Uh, and we divided this into five, uh, five or six <coughs> buckets here, which is uh, fertility, seeds and planting, field insights, weather, and uh, measurements, and then the data connectivity, which is a platform. Uh, I'd, these are divided into four or five, uh, depending upon the growth stage. One is starting with a discovery proof of concept. Phase one is we replicated at a very few small plot targeted trials. And then phase five is commercial uh, during the process. You know, it's not necessary that every project will go through the end of the cycle, but that is where we are as of, uh, as of this, uh, this uh, uh, January and different projects. Now I'll walk you through each of these and to see, give you a flavor of uh, what's been going on at Climate Corporation to, uh, as it relates to the grower. Fertility. Nitrogen. Sitting in this room uh, and working in university here and given the dairy industry you have, there is no doubt nitrogen is very complex. I don't need to t uh, preach to the, uh, to the team here. But it is as complex that it is very difficult for a grower to pr project how much nitrogen they need. Well, price of corn is a big issue, as was raised by somebody earlier, and then price of nitrogen. But the first, uh, the first project that Climate started off was, is how can we help grower manage the nitrogen? Whether, how, how can we collect data that can help him uh, have a better insight on what is going on in the soil, whether it is interaction with the weather or how the crop is growing, and how can we help you make a better citrus decision on nitrogen? Because the more you apply nitrogen in the front end, the more it is susceptible to loss, and then thereby the fertilizer use efficiency is less. So what we did is, uh, the graph you see on the left is, we developed a, a process-based model entirely developed by the climate scientists, and we are not using any publicly available models behind this. We developed a process-based model that can uh, deliver uh, information on the insights which is how much nitrogen or plant available nitrogen is there in the top two feet of the soil that can say grow to the grower, hey, this is May 21st, this is how much nitrogen is in the soil. Use this as an insight to say how much you might apply later in the growing season as a citrus. Now, the accuracy, measuring the accuracy of this is definitely debatable, whether it is what is the target yield you are trying to, approach, trying to achieve in that given year, which is the biggest unknown to many, right? Even we don't have a big handle on it, predicting how much yield a grower is going to get in the next year for a given hybrid or population or nitrogen. That is very, that is very complicated. Are we working on it? Yes. Have we cracked it completely? Probably not. Uh, we are working with many people to get to a better resolution on that. But what you're seeing here in this graph is, uh, if you see this, uh, shadow here. This is using uh, 100 weather scenario simulations and saying uh, what would be the nitrogen, uh, fate of the nitrogen in the soil given as certain weather scenarios. And then tell him this is your weather dependent range on what the soil nitrogen is going to be. The line is your median. So make an insightful addition on how much nitrogen you want to or not apply at a given time in the growing season. This is mostly a, uh, a side restore. It is not intended to be for the total nitrogen. Now, that was what we've been uh, uh, working with the growers for the past two years. But for 17, we made an improvement and said, well, we, do, we try to do what we can do with the whole field, but we know within field variability is the biggest issue for the growers. So this year, the growers can now load a field, take the CLUs, and then immediately it pops up the sergo soil types in the soil. So take the NRCO sergo soil types. And then they can run the nitrogen monitoring tool on each of those zones. And then say, well, how do I variable rate nitrogen using the nitrogen, uh, nitrogen monitoring tool? So that is an insight that the growers can again say, I don't want to manage this field as one piece, but I can split it into different, uh, different zones and manage the nitrogen. So this is year one. 
the request we have, but we are not there yet, is how do I take this and push it as a prescription directly to my cab and use it as a map that the applicator can use to apply the nitrogen. We are there on the seeding part, but we are not there yet on the nitrogen part. So I'll talk about that in a minute, about the seeding. Uh, then, uh, and then when we did the nitrogen, the request uh, was uh, coming very heavily from our customers is, it is okay to get the nitrogen, but I want to be able to see my soil test data too. If you take a typical grower now, the soil test data is coming from, so the retailer is collecting the data, it is coming in one place, it is in a CSV or whatever format the soil lab is giving. His yield data is coming from, let's say, his uh, John Deere uh, combine. And then his uh, as, uh, harvest data is um, not talking to the as planted data. And then the applicator data is not linked to, because it is coming at a different, different the Hagee or some other company, right? So how do we make all of this together to help the grower? So we said, we worked with the soil test labs and standardized the formats of uh, all the soil data coming in. Now the growers can take a soil test lab as long as in a, it is in modest format, which is the format that many labs are using, and then he can overlay that and it, view it. First, able to see, able, ability to give the grower to view his own data to make an informed decision on the nitrogen. So one is show the data and then use interpolation methods to see, tell what is the spatial variability for a particular variable, whether it is organic matter, pH, or carry-on exchange capacity, or for that matter, just texture. So we have that uh, activated now, which is in a uh, commercial stage this year, so growers can see it and use it. And then, uh, what about uh, nitrogen? Uh, we talked about nitrogen, what about P and K, the next two most important nutrients, right? We are in the early stages with P and K where Right now, last year, uh, they could do a manual. Right now, we are doing the data ingestion and then telling which of the fields are candidate fields for a particular grower to look at um, uh, P and K management. And then use that same soil testing data that I just described to say what is the variability, provide the insights, and move to prescription. This is not at a, at a, uh, at a commercial stage. It is still in the very early stages of uh, development, but we are working on that. So that's the fertility side of it. Next, moving to seeds and planting, being in, uh, being uh, coming from Monsanto, and uh, just for um, uh, clarification, Climate Corporation is a wholly owned subsidiary of Monsanto. So, seeding that is the biggest decision they make, right? Given the cost of the seed and uh, and the dish and the impact the seed will have on the total yield that they want for a particular given year, it is a lot. We have developed methods where we, if the grower has yield data in the system and it is in our climate field view system, whether it is coming through API with John Deere or API with uh, Case or API with uh, any other company, we can use that yield data and derive zones out of it that can be replicated and use those zones to project to the grower what is the seeding population they need to use for the particular field. Um, and that is the main objective here. So this is growers can do right now. And once we develop this prescription, they can import by the click of a button, it goes to their planter, and they can use it to plant. So if somebody is planting in a week from now, tomorrow or day after, they can just say, this is my yield data. And then with the click of a button, it will give them the zones. And then and the click of a button, it will be sending to the tractor to run the prescription for that particular field. So we're trying to get the variable rate technology to be used on their field using their own data sets. And then, that is a starting point, but with seed management, there are three important factors. How do we, de how do we determine the zones? What is the density we plant? And then the bigger question is, which hybrid needs to be planted in a particular field? Being, uh, having the support from Monsanto helps us to get to our earlier um, uh, levels of uh, data and uh, data, uh, field data collection where we get the pre-commercial data for a particular hybrid because the life of a hybrid is maybe four years. By the time we develop the data and try to understand the hybrid performance over three years, it's out of its uh, life cycle. So we, so what do we do? So we go into our uh, pre-commercial data sets and get to know the hybrid and its interaction with multiple environments and position that particular hybrid in a given field. So here's an example where 
we think, uh, based on the work we did with our climate research partners over the past two years, more than upwards of 90% of the uh, of the fields benefited from variable rate seeding compared to a static rate. Uh, you know, there is a uh, there could be a question always coming up saying, well, it's obviously Monsanto wants to sell more seed, so yes, more seed is going to get a response, right? It is not necessary that always more seed is uh, is the answer. It is a distribution of the same amount of seed that can make a lot of difference. Uh, we have seen uh, we have uh, good examples of that. And then selecting the hybrid for a particular field, uh, it is looking at the germplasm interaction with the environment. Uh, I know there are breeders in this room. G by E is the biggest thing uh, to work on, but. Having the access to our breeding uh, breeding group within Monsanto helps us get to this much faster than uh, than uh, probably what some of the other teams can do. Uh, so the field trials we conduct for this one are last year we had close to 300, uh, close to more than 300 where we 300 fields where we looked at not only just the final yield, but we have uh, imagery and which I'm going to talk a little bit more detail in a minute. But we have imagery at every field whether it is coming from uh, satellite or uh, aircraft. And then also some of the imagery where we have a rover going in the field and collecting LIDAR-based information on, on the height of the canopy when we measure uh, when we image it, and also the NDVI at a smaller scale that was referred to before. And we use that to evaluate our plots and look at the microenvironments and how we can say that a particular population by hybrid combination is relatively better than the other one. Okay. So, um, we, uh, we we can rely on satellite imagery to some extent, but we need the final spatial scale to get to some other uh, details that we are trying to use to get to the uh, product evaluation. So, a very few slides on our weather team. Uh, uh, the typical product that we have is go get the weather information. Uh, every time there's a rainfall event, they get an email. And we use the same weather into our uh, seeding prescriptions as an input and also to our a nitrogen uh, model, process model. Uh, so last year we got a lot of issues in saying, well, I got half an inch, but you said one inch, well, I, got, I didn't even get that much, right? So one of the improvements that we made is 14%, uh, more than 14% of our fields were very close to within a kilometer or so of a wind turbine. So our team said, how can we fix that issue? So this year, one of the improvements we made into the estimates, precipitation estimates that goes to our grower, both as a, as a product and as an input to our models, is how do we improve that by adjusting for the, uh, for the wind turbines. So that is a huge improvement, uh, at least in terms of the, uh, the accuracy of our estimates on, uh, on, uh, on precipitation. And the biggest thing for that we are working on, probably in, by 2019, we hope to help the growers, is uh, wind speed. When you are applying, uh, when you are applying your herbicide, you need to maintain. Uh, you can't apply it more than a particular higher wind speed. It has to be, let's say, within five or so. So, but the current existing estimates of wind speed are at 33 feet. No, most of it is probably a, a function of the demand coming from aviation industry. But we need something at the three feet level. So, what can we do to get there? So that's what one of the biggest projects our team is working on, to say, how do I give a field level estimate on wind speed and direction at the three feet level and not at the 33 feet level, which can be really used by the growers? Because uh, drift of the chemical is the biggest issue, especially if you have two crops in, in, in the near vicinity. Field insights, uh, I know there's a lot talked about remote sensing uh, prior to me here, so I'll be real fast here. Is, uh, whether it is satellite imagery or is it um, is a drone or camera or just a phone pictures that we have seen so far, uh, our team will, uh, gets all of those and we use combinations of those to get to uh, describing the variability within a field and then trying to link it to what is in the what is the yield in a particular field to get to a decision for the grower, and um, and basically we use that to provide a. Uh, a map of the different fields that, are, that need immediate attention by a grower to scout versus those that don't need immediate attention. And then we collected at all the growing, all the uh, different phases of the season, whether it is pre or during the growing season or after, because uh, residue and uh, those kind of issues do matter. Uh, uh, 
what kind of data layers from uh, remote sensing do we use? Uh, right now we have Landsat, Deimos, and RapidEye, and aircraft at different spatial resolution. When a grower sees a field, we usually, in his account, he can see about five to six images for the same field in a given year. And we show them, and as mentioned, whether it is a high resolution or a low spatial resolution. That way we are not uh, up, up sampling and down sampling each of those fields. Uh, disease is a biggest uh, biggest issue for the growers, uh, and uh, most more so with um, with uh, with the modeling approaches. Because once we see the disease in the field, it is probably too late to spray. So how do how do we how do we help that? So we got a team working on our, on our agronomic models to determine if uh, if. Uh, uh, the environmental conditions are good enough uh, for a particular pathogen uh, and then to see if it comes beyond a threshold level for the particular grower to apply. And then use the imagery to say where do I need to apply that, where do I need to go and scout for an image, depending upon the growth stage. Uh, a classic example last year from a grower in uh, Illinois was he's got 140 fields and we told him, hey, we got satellite imagery, aircraft imagery, use it to help. He says, I don't have the time. He said, here are the problems. Here is a variability in each of the field in second week of June. Can you help uh, have your guys scout it? He says, no, give me an output map of where I need to go because 140 fields, it's not worth their time to go every field and walk. So we're not only identifying the problem, we need to tell them where to go and sample it. And the other issue is uh, identifying whether it is a biotic stress or abiotic stress. It is one thing because chlorosis can be due to many reasons. So we need, we, there is a pressure on us to say, tell me what is the issue rather than telling me there is an issue so that they can make a remediative steps to recover from the potential yield loss. Uh, one other thing that the, the, the field insights team does is cleaning yield data. This is a big thing for us because you get data from multiple combines, and sometimes the same field is harvested by two combines. So we need to take care of uh, the cleaning of the yield data to make data meaningful for a grower. Uh, in, like I said, grower applies uh, different nitrogen rates or hybrids and tests our products here, but we need to check for the yield, whether it is calibrated or not, what is the speed he's traveling in, are there any wet spots where he's changing the speed that is influencing the grain flow, what is the flow delay, what is the moisture delay of the grain? How do we account for all those to make sure that the particular yield data set is usable for us for making decisions? For example, if he has two hybrids and he's looking at the difference on the performance of those, it's got to be, it's got to be something that we can really trust. So we put a lot of effort in cleaning yield data. And same thing with plant, as planted files from seeding on what is the population he's applying, or same thing with the as planted files for nitrogen. Uh, one other team we have is working on measurements. So the sensor technology is big. We need a lot of data within the field to be able to help the grower make more uh, useful decisions on his field. So uh, along with our field view drive here that I'm seeing, we do use uh, OptRx or collecting NDVI information on the go at the different multiple go stages. And then sensors placed on, uh, on, the, on the planter itself. And then we also work with third-party vendors to get information like we have about, I think, five eddy covariance towers within our network that we collect data to use. And then also the so, uh, uh, sensors like the various. But the biggest thing we are working on right now is a nitrate sensor. About a year and a half ago, or maybe close to two years, we bought a small company out of Oregon called Supra Sensor. What they have is a sensor that is probably not even as big as this that can measure the nitrate in the soil. It is in a very pre-commercial stages. So it is probably at a, a phase one or two. Uh, I think we have gone past the proof of concept. It, is, it has got a proprietary coating where when it comes in contact with the uh, soil solution can measure the nitrate levels in the soil uh, uh, almost real time. What we are trying to do now is see if we can put that sensor in one of these along with the moisture, which is, we're starting with the electrical conductivity, but we would like to move towards a time domain refractometry to get a much better volumetric content, and then a soil temperature probe. And on top of it would be a rain gauge, and this would be talking to the field view cab, 
and what we're calling it is connected fields. The idea is we need on-site, on-specific data to help calibrate the models specific to a particular grower field rather than getting it to at a much higher spatial scale. So these are the sensor networks that uh, we have been working on. Uh, talk a little bit about data privacy. Uh, this is very serious for us. Uh, all the data that the grower gives is his data and he can delete it whenever he wants. And then we do not use their data for anything without their consent. It has to be it has to be a permission from them for us to use. And then we work with the National Corn Growers Association and the American Farm Bureau Association to make sure that we stick, uh, we stick to the principles developed by them on the data privacy policies. So most of the data, like I said, is we use some of the grower data, but it is only after their consent. But for all the model development and everything, we use the Monsanto and the Climate Research Farm Network data sets that we have. <coughs> Uh, some final thoughts uh, before I wrap up. Uh, what we're trying to do at Climate is make it easier for the grower to use his own data and um, get more insights and implement those in his farm. So first thing we need to do is make sure that they get the current products right, whether it is nitrogen or seeding or whether it is field insights. And then look at the future products like uh, PNK irrigation, and also, uh, also herbicide application, like I said, and then harvest timing. Because if you have 100 fields or 50 fields, the, way, the sequence of your harvest matters. And idle time of a machine is too much money lost. And then, as I said, Climate Value is a platform. So there are things that if we build a platform, we don't want, uh, we don't want people to be uh, spending resources on trying to build another platform. We are working with third, third party platforms like Veris or even uh, Agco and other companies to say, how can you use our platform to get to your data sets? So that's what we are working on, whether it is drone imagery that a grower collects, but how can you use it, uh, use the Climate View platform to use the drone imagery for his own field? Uh, sensors and equipment and then retail platforms, whether it is the CPS or the Helena or whatever is the retail partners that you need to work, uh, can they use the same platform to get to uh, helping the growers and managing their decisions? So uh, I think I'm going to stop there, see if there uh, are any questions. So there's plenty of, plenty of time for, for questions. So. How do you handle variability from caused by legacy prescriptions or future prescriptions? It seems like you're and variability, and you're just compounding the problem in the future. So if, if I repeat the question, you're saying, how does the variability, the maps you give a grow for one year, for, does the variability affect your input in the next year? Yes, we have people, we are working on it. Uh, so yield map. So yield data is a prerequisite for running the seeding prescription. So if you got the yield data coming from last year, and you got the causal uh, factors, whether it is the variable rate density or variable rate nitrogen that is causing in, into the variability, we take that into account for year two. Uh, it's not at a commercial level, but it's at R&D level, yes. We are doing that. Go ahead. Um, to what extent or to what degree uh, are the capabilities for doing a soil mapping? I assume it's not the same thing as a USDA soil survey. Uh, let me see if I got your question. You're saying how are we managing the mapping of fields <coughs> for how soil? It in, how, in how much detail? So, we, for example, if there are sensors that we can place on uh, a planter, if it is a 32-row planter, we put it in two, two of the rows. So you got every 16 rows, you got a line that gives you soil properties. So let's say near infrared reflectance in the top three centi three inches of the field that can give you. Uh, 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 estimate of organic matter, for example, or electrical conductivity. If you take Veris, it is you get one line every every 40 feet or 60 feet transects, but you get every one second information, and then you use spatial st statistical approaches to get to a map of let's say 10 meter by 10 meter or anything finer than that. So that is some of the soil test. You know, <laughs> what we see is two and a half acres and then you use that uh, to interpolate and get to the information. Okay. 
Okay, so it's like the USDA soil survey, except on much larger scale. Much finer spatial scale, mm -hmm. yes. yes. Well, I have a question about the, I call it, I guess, on-farm experimentation. Yes. I was looking at the one map of the different two hybrids. You have the, how much do you automate or facilitate the farmer planting at different, say, seeding densities as experimentally, like plus or minus 10% over the recommended rate? or nitrogen application or something like that. Can you talk about automation of on-farm experimentation to right. update from your farm? Perfect, good question. So what we, what I showed you with our field prescriptions, right? If, if a, the zones that he, so let me give you an example on how that, that is being done right now by a grower. He has a field of 80 acres and he says, I'm going to use the Sergo zones on this one. But the field view system allows him to tweak those zones to his light because the growers know their field more than we do. So if they think that they can, they say, I know this part works better over here, they're going to tweak it. And then the field view system allows them to put multiple seeding rates within that zone to test our zone versus his rates. So which, what we call is learning plots. It is learning plots for the grower, and it is learning for us. When we get the data back, we can say, what made us go wrong in that field? What do you do for input besides seeding? Do you, can you do any other ones? Uh, right now, nitrogen. Uh, right now nitrogen, but it is at a spatial scale. For the zones for nitrogen, we are still using Sergo. We don't have our own way of developing zones for nitrogen. We are very close, but it is not commercial yet. But for seeding, we use the historical <laughs> yield data to get to the zones. Oh, so, uh, let me go there. Go ahead. Okay. So going back to some of the talks this morning and uh, Colby's flower plant, um, this is really an incredible opportunity to partner the environmental impacts um, with yield. And that's what I'm interested in, is looking at how, how can we use precision air agriculture and some of the technology that you're talking about to also improve environmental impacts. Um, and as you mentioned, the data are proprietary to the farmers. But let's just say, for example, I, I were to get you know 25 farmers to agree to share their spatial data with me, and I wanted to use you know, agrolibus and assess environmental impacts of implementing like, zone-based management. Um, how are the data kept? Are they kept in a, such a way where they've been, they've been processed to, I can't kind of go back and um, you know, access the data and make them available to me as a scientist? Or have they been you know, completely processed to make them so user-friendly that, for example, like water content is in some weird relative you know, index that I don't understand? Like, is there a way for us to use this opportunity to, you know, also um, study the environmental impacts of precision agriculture? So what, what you're asking is, is the data available in a way that we can use, or do you convert into a format that is, yeah. makes no sense for people outside of uh, the, our network? No, right now everything is stored in the way it comes in. All only we thing we do is apply our algorithms to clean the data. And uh, some of the thing is, uh, it may be, for depending upon the layer of interest. We might get it to a finer grade or a coarser grade, but the actual data is still preserved because it is a grower data. So yes, and, uh, and are we collecting anything towards uh, environmental information? One way to look at it is we are not there yet, is uh, if, you decrease them, if you increase the synchrony of demand and supply of nitrogen, the potential that is available to even leaching decreases. <coughs> so that is a starting point. Uh, on similar topic, with respect to the grower quantitative, do you have any existing partnerships or relationships with universities or other outside research organizations where you are able to share in confidence that information for them to provide research that they then provide back to you or the growers, which adds value for them as well? One of our collaborators is sitting in that corner there. Uh, we do work with Matt Rourke uh, in, in, the, in the soil science department. Uh, on a plot scale research work, and we do give um, many universities uh, about 120 acres of uh, climate free of charge so that they can evaluate our product and do whatever testing they need to do. Uh, did I get to your question on that? I think so. And, okay. and you mentioned uh, you ask your growers if you use the data for anything outside of your policy, it's using it for research that can value them already, including your policy? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
I'm going to go there in the back end. Yes. Already, already farmers actually interested in the privacy policy, already deleting their data. Um, perhaps you can't tell us that, but, but I'm wondering also if you're dealing with EU nations, have you a, a different set of privacy stipulations? Got it. So, uh, privacy policy and growers are reading it. Yes, they are reading it. I don't have market data to tell you what percentage and everything, but yes, they are reading it very actively because we do partner with na National Corn Growers Association on it. International, Europe. Uh, we are in the very beginning stages. Uh, there is not an equivalent. I think in the US, we are spoiled by the Sergo data to some extent. There is not an equivalent data whether you go to South America or Europe. Uh, but, and if it is there, the spatial extent is not as good or uh, usable as it is in the U.S. Uh, I, I think it is a different, not think, it is a different user policy in uh, Europe. When we talk to Europe, uh, uh, Europe uh, counterparts, they tell us, well, don't you even pay the growers to give you the data? So it's a different discussion in Europe, but yeah, it is different. Go ahead. I want to go back to the question about the new experiments inside farms, uh, and you mentioned also like to, you need to understand cause or effects to be able to decide intervention for next year, for example, right? But, so it seems to me that you have a very rich data uh, with seed by environment interaction and distribution mm -hmm. and geographic distribution. So it seems that you can also mine this data to try to learn about cause effects, of course, electron organization, you have the so we use our control experiments to get to that. With growers, we can't control because we can only experiment on the grower first to the extent he's comfortable not changing it that his bottom line is going to be influenced. For example, nitrogen. In my research farms, I can put a zero nitrogen field or even maybe a 60 or 100 pound nitrogen. I can't do that in a grower field. So that, that limits to how much we can use a particular grower field. But what you get is uh, with our research partner network is the wide environment that you're going to cover rather than just the four or five research farms that I have about each with about 1,200 acres or so. So the network we can get and the intensive measurements and the extensive measurements we can take in each of these various. So, and that's where our uh, Monsanto breeding network helps us because they have, a, because we got what? Close to maybe 50, 60 hybrids that we sell, or even more than that. And we got to test each of those in their respective environments. And we use that data set to help us get a head start. One, one last question. Uh, go ahead. Yes, we have looked into so what you're saying is the is the is the rate of adoption and the probability of success in a sub hundred hundred bushel acre, acre, hundred bushel range versus maybe a two hundred plus is different. The the slope of that is totally different in those two. Have you looked at it? Yes. Uh, and those uh, one way to look at it is is spatial variability my most important or a temporal variability? And I think we, are, we, we have not made it commercial yet, but we do look at, is this field even a candidate field for spatial variable? If not, it's okay for us to say, no, don't do anything variable. Do what you're doing with respect to seed, for example, or with respect to nitrogen. So those, yes, we are looking into it, but it's not at a point where we're saying, this geography, we don't even need to address it. We're not there yet, but uh, we're working in it. It's probably at a phase two level. Great. Right. Thank you. Let's thank Dr. Sripada one more time. Thank you.